Welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast. This is your proprietor, Tony Ortega. And I'm really thrilled to have John Atak back on the podcast by popular demand because, John, you really uncorked a beauty this week. You told me this was coming for a little while. Mm -hmm. I was looking forward to it. Uh, I myself have had to deal with a little Charles Manson misinformation over the years. But wow, did you really dig into some interesting things this week? And I'm sure people would love to hear a little bit more about how you decided to do this piece and how it came together. Hmm. Well, it, it was really, I, I took with Eric Hunley. Yeah, so after the show, Eric Hunley said to me, you know, your friend Jolly West programmed the Manson family. And, you know, that's a little bit of a surprise when, you know, somebody who's a friend of yours years back and you kind of go, oh, yeah, he was responsible for setting up this mass murder. And, you know, you like to think that, you know, your friends, you know, it's like if somebody called me up and said, yeah, that Tony Ortega, you know, he was actually responsible for sinking the Bismarck, you know, <laughs> you'd be kind of OK. Right. So. I, I, I ran off and, and picked up the copy of, of Chaos by O'Neill, which, which I bought some years ago. And, uh, you know, I'd put it down because it didn't mention Scientology. How can you write about Manson without mentioning Scientology? You know, and so I read what he had to say about Jolly and my jaw kept on dropping until it was pretty much on the floor because he doesn't have anything except, as he says, they walked the same corridors at some point. That's not much in the way of corroborating evidence, is it? No, and he spent 20 years writing this book, and the Times Literary Supplement called it a masterpiece. And it, it's such a subject. Manson is, you know, you know, a negative icon, let's say. And the evidence of Manson's involvement in Scientology, I was surprised to find was really well documented. Mm -hmm. I, I really like Jeff Gwynn's biography of Manson that came out, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. Mm -hmm. And and he had, uh, I think, gone to the same sources you have for these documents about that. You know, Charlie spent so many years in custody in, in, in the penitentiary or something. And at one point in Washington State, he was in a prison and his cellmate was a Scientologist, right? Isn't that how this all happened? Yeah, Lania Raymer, who actually one of the Scientology documents uh, says that Lania Raymer was in prison because he'd robbed a bank so he could afford to pay for Scientology. <laughs> oh. And this was about, I think it was a bit like 63 or something like that. 60 62. And okay. it went on for 14 months. And Manson by this time is what, 27 years old. And by his own admission, he's just learned to read and write. Uh. And so he gets, according to Scientology's own internal documents, he, he gets something like 150 hours of Scientology processing. Now, just to clue people in a little bit here, I was involved in Scientology for nine years. I probably didn't have 150 hours wow. of auditing during that wow. time. So that's like it was over a 14 month period. So you're looking at the equivalent of like three hour long sessions a week, something like that. And the, he, he says, I, I got pretty heavily involved in Dianetics and Scientology. He read everything he could. And of course, he did training routine zero. You know, very conveniently, Scientology provide us with a list of the processes that he did. Um, yeah, which is all internal. It's all, oh, we've got to stop this thing from happening. And the the primary report, there are several documents. The primary one is from June 1970, which is to say it's a month before the Manson trial begins. And a report goes up to Mary Sue Hubbard, um, running the Guardian's Office of Scientology, to say, this is what we know. We, and he had these processes, he did these things. So this incredible situation you have this guy as he says you know he, from the age of 12 for the next 20 years he spends most of his time in institutions and he's a little guy he's yep. what, five foot five at, at maximum and he gets beaten up a lot yeah, of course it's, it's right. not a not a happy place to be then he gets Scientology 
And as he says, he gets confidence with this. He finds out that, that you can face people down. And that, you know, you get the, the famous thousand mile stare, the, right. the Manson stare. And you go, well, that's training routine zero. That, you know, I, that's, that's what we were trained to do. To, and it right. does, it intimidates people, you know. Well, and I, rem I remember from Gwyn's book that the, there was a note from the warden saying that they were happy that Charlie had found something, right? Yeah. yeah be careful what you wish for. Yeah. So um, he had this intense Scientology training uh, from a fellow inmate. What happened with his Scientology after he left that prison, John? What, what do we know? We don't really know anything except that, that when you look at Scientology's own documents, there were three other members of the family who'd done Scientology. Okay. And, you know, he says that, that, um, that, that at the largest, the family was 35 people. Um, and you've got Leslie Van Houten, who's come up for parole. She was involved. You've got Bruce Davis, who also was sent to prison. Sandra Good. And she's um, one of the girls in Manson, the Lost Tapes, uh, this incredible documentary that, you know, somebody went down a week after Manson was arrested to Spahn's movie ranch and filmed these girls, you know, they're young women possibly, but they're mainly teenagers. Right. And you see what's happened to them. You know, they're sat there, they've all got buzz cuts. They're all sat there with kind of weapons <laughs> And they're, they're, they're waiting for helter skelter. They're waiting for it to happen. And that was filmed and then put in somebody's garage. And oh, wow. And years later, somebody finds it and they go and interview, um, I think most, I think there were five women in, in five girls and they interview them later on. And I think that gives you a much more complete idea of, of the process of conditioning that they'd been through. Um, the, which is a kind of mixture of trauma bonding. One, one of the um, women says that, that Manson raped her um, brutally. And of course, he in his book is about what a nice guy he is and how lovely he is, which is a bit hard to believe, really. Um, but he's, you know, so you've got the trauma bonding, you've got the use of violence and overwhelming people, and you've then got that within the context of Scientology and this mm. way of, of dealing with people. And I think it's perhaps been missed um, because Scientology s appears to be so incredibly complicated, but it actually rests upon a very few ideas and, and then an elaboration of pro pro processes and procedures. And at the heart of Scientology is the notion of control. There's a, a thing that, that bothered me a little when I was involved that Hubbard says there is no such thing as bad control. Mm. You know, control is always good, you know, and it's kind of, yeah, okay. And, but at the center of Scientology is this notion of infinite control. Um, Hubbard, because he was a bit confused about the infinity symbol, used to stand it up and use the number eight right. to replace the <laughs> infinity symbol. Don't know why. Right. You know, um, maybe printers didn't have infinity. I was going to say, maybe typewriters didn't have them in those, those days. So. Yeah. And he couldn't, couldn't write it in. But so, you know, we got Scientology 0 0.8, Scientology 8.80, Scientology 8, 8,008. He was obsessed with, with, with this idea, which probably has some kind of Crowleyite background to it as well. But, um, so he's, at the heart of Scientology is that the, what you are going to do is you are going to be, become a kind of magician or sorcerer and be able to project your intention on other people. Mm -hmm. And what that boils down to in, in the C organization in Scientology is shouting. Mm -hmm. you know, that You yell at people, you get really close to them so that they can feel the spittle hitting their face and you give them a severe reality adjustment, which is called tone 40 which confused me in Scientology because tone 40 is serenity of beingness. And right. there is nothing serene about this process, right. um, which I only witnessed once in all the time I was in Scientology. And when I did it, it sort of freaked me out. And then I discovered that you know, Hubbard did it pretty much every day. He liked screaming at people. Mm. 
And this whole idea of control that you get people to submit to you, to your will and do what you want. That's the core of Scientology. That, that's what the highest level, the operating Thetan uh, section eight course is about becoming at cause over mental and physical matter, energy, space, and time. So you'll not only be able to shout at people and get them to do things, you'll be able to shout at, you know, ashtrays and tables and refrigerators, and they will do your bidding. But this intention is, is the central idea of Scientology. Absolutely. And I can see that being useful to somebody like Charlie, uh, as he was finally uh, out on the street uh, after so many years behind bars, and made his way to hate Ashbury, right? And uh, again, and Jeff, I, again, I really like Jeff Gwynn's book. What he was talking about was, you know, he had spent all that time really soaking in Scientology, but he was the kind of guy, kind of like Hubbard, that was picking up other ideas and making, you know, making them his and adding to his patter. So that by the time he started creating the family in hate Ashbury, he had a whole set of these notions that he had kind of, you know, made his own. Uh, but that Scientology was definitely part of that mix. I think it's the essential part. I mean, he says that that at McNeil Island, he started reading books on psychiatry. I don't really see somebody who's just learned to read and write, you know, reading the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual or anything like that. He says he was reading books on hypnosis, mm. um, which is, of course, a less refined form of Scientology. But the Scientology is at the center of that. So yes, as with Hubbard, Hubbard, of course, a, um, a friend of mine went to St. Hill Manor many years ago in the 90s and was offered a tour. And he went into Oral Hubbard's office and he started writing down the titles of the books. And the next time he went, because he was rushed out, all the books had been taken off the shelves. Oh. And those books were kind of 1930s and 40s hypnosis manuals, 25 lessons in hypnotism, um, hypnotism comes of age, I've, I've found and read these stupid things. They were cheap novels, and they were Alistair Crowley books, and they were right there in his office. And I, I think that Manson, you're dealing with a, a similar kind of cunning mind. These are not intellectuals. Ron Hubbard was not somebody who had a deep education in philosophy and the classics. Um, but he was very good at, at picking things out of Reader's Digest and the boys' own manuals and then making them sound as if there was something, you know, remarkable. And I think Manson, too, had an eye for, for the main chance and, and he knew what he was looking for. And I think there is, you know, I, I think the Noel Emmons um, autobiography of Manson, you know, and Emmons interviewed him over a period of years in prison. And I think it is a fairly genuine piece of work. You can see that Emmons has definitely corrected the language, you know, I, I would think, looking at the way Manson spoke. But I think that he's tried to stay true to what's being said. Mm -hmm. And I think we see this conflict in Manson that you also see in Hubbard. I think Hubbard was trying to cure himself. You know, that so he came up with all of these procedures and processes and right from the start in Dianetics, the mental science of modern health, he starts talking about, he gives you a list of all the things that Dianetics cures. And you go, well, this is odd. These are all things he suffered from. You know, <laughs> asthma, short-sightedness, not long-sightedness, short-sightedness. Bursitis, which I'd never heard of, you know, a lubrication between a, a muscle and a, and a bone. And I think he, was, he desperately believed in the usual faith healing way. You know, for three days, you feel great. And then and down you go. So I think Hubbard somehow recognized that there was deep evil inside him. And I, you know, I in studying his background, I started to feel that the the kind of good part of Hubbard probably came from his grandfather, Leif Waterbury, who of course his father was pretty much out of the picture when he was young. He lived with his mum and his aunts. Uh, Russell Miller interviewed Margaret Roberts, who is one of the aunts, who was only eight years older than Hubbard, and somehow knew nothing about the time that he spent with the Blackfoot um, people when he was a child. She'd never heard about that before, even though he was, in fact, a blood brother at the age of two right, or four. Right. 
or six, depending which of his accounts. I went into the circle at the age of two, and but, oh dear. That, but you've got this. I think this drive that probably came from Waterbury, who I think gave him this sense of importance about himself, as we do with our children and our grandchildren. But Hubbard bought into this and he wanted to be good. He wanted to be good. And there are still people out there. I, 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 you sent me a link to something that, that Irk had made, Ken Urquhart had made. And I couldn't watch it. It's just, it's so sad to still be so besotted yeah. with a man who was throwing people, what, 25 feet from the deck of his ship into human sewage in Corfu Harbour and go, he was the great saviour of mankind. It's like, I'm afraid <laughs> not. But I think that contest between good and evil happened in Manson as well. And the perception of Manson is that he was thoroughly evil. He, you know, he, he was a devil, a demon. I don't think that's true. I, I think that he really did want to do something good when he gets out of prison and in the spring of 67 gets to hate Ashbury and things drifted things went wrong and part of his sense of good you got the sense of he's picking up all of these runaway girls um who've had you know obviously a, a dreadful family experience to be out there on the street at 14 15 years old and i think that he did just as hubbard told himself stories about how much good he was doing to the world i think manson was was also believing the stories he was telling himself but it gradually slid into crime and corruption and then you know i think the thing that really shocks me with o'neill is he doesn't know anything about the datura mm. which is the drug that manson uh, and tex watson who was in prison for the, um, the tate and the labianca murders he doesn't he hasn't picked this up and it they both talk about it you know and um they both call it talache tea, which confused me until I found a, an ethnobotanist who was incredibly helpful. He came straight back to me and said, no, this, tolo, this is toloache. This is datura. And curiously, I'd encountered stuff about datura. And as a teenager, mm. I, I got very interested in the criminal, criminalization of cannabis for, for reasons that people have probably worked out by now. You know, at 17, I was busted. For, for having you know enough cannabis for a joint which was a terrible thing back then um and so i read you know what i'm like i read what i could find and i found out about the british india hemp drugs commission which i think is still the largest survey of drugs ever it was in the 1890s Ten thousand people were interviewed and at the end of this there's an eight volume report and at the end of it they say um Cannabis should remain legal in India. There are no problems. Alcohol should remain illegal in India. It's a dreadful thing. And datura should be extirpated. And I'd wow. never heard the word extirpated, pulled up by the roots. Wow. And because datura has never been made illegal, it's perfectly available. It grows all over the place. Uh, it's sold as a garden flower, one of the versions, Brugmansia. And every now and then you hear about somebody that smoked a leaf of it and ended up in hospital. They were boiling up the roots. And it, you know, it said, um, Tex Watson has said that the day before the Tate murders, he'd taken the stuff and it, it lasts for about three days. So, and it's, it's called a delirium. It's not a drug like LSD where, you know, things, you know, shift around a little bit, but you still know where you are. You are placed in a different reality. You are in the middle of a nightmare. Um, ayahuasca and ibogaine are also delirious and, and will put you into a, an, a completely altered reality. And you know, as, as my friend, the ethnobotanist said, it is the very definition of, of a bad trip. So you got people taking this and then taking LSD over the top of it. What do you think is going to happen? And they've been corralled into this way of thinking, the idea that four of them were Scientologists. And this is by Hubbard's definition of a Scientologist, by the way. Hubbard said that anybody that uses That's any right. aspect of Scientology right. is a Scientologist. So right. game set and match on that one. And that way of thinking, you know, Manson was big on reincarnation. 
an essential principle of Scientology. And like Scientologists, he didn't realize that Hind to Hindus and Buddhists, it's a bad thing. You know, it's the wheel of suffering. It's the, the fear of the eternal return is, is the expression used by Buddhists. Whereas in Scientology, it's like, oh, I'll be able to do it in my next lifetime. And which, you know, horribly and to some extent explains why the suicide rate is somewhat higher in Scientology because people go, well, I've screwed up. I can do it in my next lifetime. Mm. Not really a, a good solution, I don't think. So so uh, there's evidence of the presence of Scientology training, mm -hmm. of this Datura drug being used, LSD being used. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is any serious attempt to understand where Charlie was coming from, how he controlled these people, and how they ended up committing these horrible crimes should take those things into account. I mean, obviously it doesn't explain everything, but it's, no. it's something that, sh that should inform a serious investigation. Instead, what you were concerned about was this book ignored all of those and instead pointed the finger at Jolly West, who was this <laughs> academic who was maybe the, you know, uh, Steve Kent of his day, right? A serious yeah. academic who yes. looked at Scientology and was harassed by Scientology. Um, and like you said, uh, what alarmed you was there just wasn't very much evidence at all to make that case, right? There wasn't anything. And and that was what really got me. And, and in the piece with Eric Cunley and, and you know, even more so in, in the article you've, you've put up at the bunker, he repeatedly says, I don't have any evidence. This is speculation. And... It bothers me because the presumption would be somebody who'd be willing to do that would have to be fairly twisted. What's being said is that he picks up Manson in the Haight-Ashbury in the spring of 67, and we therefore would be saying that he was running the family for two and a half years, even though O'Neill is not able to find any single connection between him and, and the member. Two and a half years of running that. And the idea that you take somebody like Manson and use them as your instrument in an MK Ultra program to cause mass murder. To what end? Exactly. What, how would you be using this? And what we know about MK Ultra is that, that it's a program that's stimulated by the fear that the Russians and the Chinese have learned out and found out how to make a Manchurian candidate, how to make, you know, a, a zombie that you can control as, you know, Richard Condon's novel, then the, the brilliant Lawrence Harvey film, then the brilliant Denzel Washington film, people start feeling that this is somehow um, factual. It's fictional. And the, the way that you know, it came out in the Russian purges under, under Stalin, that you know, high-ranking officials were going on the stand and being filmed confessing to things they could not possibly have done. And so it's right. like, oh, this Pavlov and all of this is happening. No, they were saying, we will torture and kill your children if you don't say this. It's a traditional method, you know. Um, and while you can get somebody in the short term, you know, part of my study, you know, the whole subject has fascinated me for decades. So part of my study in the 1990s was of suicide bombers. And ultimately, there are only two people that are or three people I really trust on that. One's a real Merari in, in Tel Aviv, um, and the other two are Anne Speckhart and Captor Ahmedova. And they studied the Black Widows in Chechnya. Lots of people like Gerald Post wrote about suicide bombers, but it's all a second hand. These people went and interviewed people who'd failed and the families of members, and they found out. And what Merari points out is that, yes, the, for the most part, and he studied hundreds of cases, what happens is, is a young person over the age of 17, this is one of the rules apparently in Palestine, um, over the age of 17 is recruited and within three days they will be dead. So this is two and a half years. Now, if you want to get somebody into that berserk state where they will harm somebody, then it's done in a short period of time. But the other thing is it's done in a context. So in, in Israel and Palestine, we have a situation where there is a tremendous division between the two societies there that has 
a hell of a history to it. And so you'll get situations where um, a three-year-old, two, three-year-old uh, Palestinian or, or Israeli Arab child, they'll take them to a, a photographer, put a little suicide belt on them and have a picture taken. It's a, there's a cultural thing going on there. And within that context, you can get somebody to do something. But the kids who are recruited, you know, you'll have what's called an engineer, who's the guy who makes the bombs, and then you'll have the recruiter. And they are the people who've got the qualifications and the intellectual equipment to set this up and do it. The dupe who is, is going to die in this process, it's a very short-term process. These are not smart people generally that, you know, upset kids and of course then you sell them the idea that when they wake up after the explosion they'll have 70 horrors to play with in paradise and you know we don't really have anything that suggests that with manson the whole idea of helter skelter seems to have been largely put together by vincent bugliosi uh, who and i think o'neill is great on the subject of bugliosi and what a crackpot you know corrupt psychopath he is mm. and there's that notion psychopath i i only met jolly four times but we spent hours talking and psychopath you know he's you know, um o'neill cites somebody who'd known him briefly as saying he was the most charming psychopath i ever met psychopath a psychopath who criticized Aaron hubbard the first time i think in 1952 and spent the next 40 seven years very publicly at going after Scientology. Why would a psychopath do that? Yeah. Put themselves self in arms. He was a friend of Martin Luther King. He, he risked everything that people risk by joining the civil rights movement and being active. Um, it just doesn't fit that character of person. Um, and we now hear that O'Neill is, is at, I only said for the last two years, he's been working on a book about Jolly West. So it's like, oh no. I, I'm rather hoping that, that we've scuppered that project, you know, or he's a good researcher or pointed him towards a place where he can say, actually, I was wrong. And, you know, Jolly West was not the person I, I believe him to have been. That's interesting that he's kind of going to keep going with that same subject. Well, he says he's uh, my great white whale, doesn't he? So he's yeah. like, and that's that poor Captain Ahab, you know, I know he lost his leg, which is not good, but, you know, that poor whale, you know, all the things it had to put up with. Oh. So, uh, okay. So, um, I mean, you pointed to some really interesting ways that the, the whole Manson family and Manson himself should be looked at. Mm -hmm. um, so then... You know, he's arrested. And this was, I got to tell you, this was new. I had not heard the words Operation Rawhide before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is the, uh, so once Manson is arrested, the Guardian's office freaks out and they are going to try to find out everything they can about Manson and his involvement in Scientology. Tell me about that. Well, it, it as I say, you know, very soon after he's arrested, something comes in. And in the Guardian's office, as you know, you, you're one of the few people who's really studied this subject and produced, you know, fantastic book. The Unbreakable Miss Lovely is a wonderful book. Thank you. But so you've seen how the Guardian's office worked. This material is what's called red box data. So wherever there was a, you know, a deputy guardian they had a red box and the red box was the stuff that had to be destroyed if there was a raid when the fbi performed the largest raid in its history on scientology in washington dc and la they got the red boxes and the manson stuff operation rawhide is red box material it was never meant to see the light of day um i had a very strange conversation with with a guy in um I was in uh, in the Bay Area back in 86 and um, I'd, I'd just held, you know, 20 or 30 people had, had come up to hear me talk and everybody had gone. We were in Sun, in fact, no, I was in LA. I wasn't in the Bay, I was, I was in Sunland. And um, they had a hot tub outside and I'm sat in the hot tub watching the lights, you know, all that stuff in the valley, great. And this guy comes along and he's, 
He knows he's come late. He's come late deliberately, said, I want to meet you. My name is Joe Leonard. That's not my real name. That's always a good introduction, isn't it? Right. He said, I worked in Guardian's office, public relations. I am the only person who read all of the material that was seized by the FBI. I'm going to oh. get in the hot tub. Let's talk. You know? <laughs> and he said that there was a bureau in the Guardian's office that had never been made public called Bureau 4. So we had B1 and B2, um, covert and overt data collection. It's so nice that Hubbard actually put it on the organizing board that he got a covert data collection. We don't know what B3 might have been, but he's saying there's B4. And then he said they were the armed office of the Guardian's office. They, they, and the operation, and he said that what happened with the Justice Department was they couldn't read Scientology's. So they didn't know R245 means kill somebody. And yeah, you know, I mean, anybody's going to get lost in the loaded language that just, you know, two 600 page dictionaries of absolute abject nonsense that Hubbard had come up with. And he said they had the reports, he'd read them, where they were, for example, going to um, gay clubs, gay bars, and he said that, that they would put a, a gun in the mouth of the owner of the club and say, if this guy comes in, you throw him out and show them a picture of Quentin Hubbard, mm. the successor to Scientology, who sadly committed suicide at the age of 22. So there's this other dynamic that's functioning. And I, I came away from that going, is this true? <laughs> you know, I, I've nothing has ever confirmed it. I did interview somebody else who'd also reckoned to have read all of that material. I don't see how anybody could have read all that material. You know, there's just too much of it. Um, but nonetheless, he didn't, he didn't have anything about this. But there's this idea, you know, how did they get to the Manson thing that quickly? So the cover up was, first of all, they found Lania Raymer, the man who'd audited him for 150 hours. And we have a list of some of the processes, you know, it's all carefully documented in the way that Scientology does. They then get Lania Raymer to, to write an affidavit saying, I've, I've never been, I am not now, nor have I ever been a member of the Church of Scientology. Um, and you're kind of going, how did you know how to audit that many processes yeah, if really. you weren't trained? Because they're not processes you'll find in the Scientology books. They're in the Scientology course materials. Mm. So they want to, they're going, this, this will break out. And of course, when um, the other week, Psychology Today ran a piece where, you know, about Leslie Van Houten and uh, Steve Hassan wrote the piece saying, you know, he thinks she should get parole because of the amount of control involved. And let's face it, it's been a long time, 50 years in prison, you know, and Psychology Today pulled the paragraph where he said she'd done that, that Manson had 150 hours of auditing. I was in correspondence with them the same day and said, here is the document written to Mary Sue Hubbard. And I said, you know, I'm a court appointed expert witness. Um, I, I put this statement in, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky in 1990. And I was sued for that book in New York and here. They didn't sue me over what I said about Manson though. I think you're safe. And we got back this kind of anodyne, well, we don't have time to look at books and chapters. <laughs> it was like, yeah, the evil triumphs when women of good do nothing. Um, so yeah, the, this whole business that, that Scientology knew this and they wanted to deflect attention. And what Scientology had done with Psychology Today, and this is just over a week ago, is sent them a, an article from the Guardian newspaper in 1971, the UK Guardian, saying that uh, there'd been this suit because they'd been libeled by, by saying that Manson had been involved with them. And this therefore proved that you mustn't say this. This was found convincing by Psychology Today. Um, of course, the, the documents that we've got came from the July 77 raids, so they were not there. So to this day, Scientology is, is working on this cover-up. And that stimulated me even more. I was already working on this piece. It was like, you know, this cowardice 
you know, in the face of Scientology, it, 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 it really isn't the right way to go. And of course, nobody knows that better than you. Nobody has done more in the last <laughs> 10 years than you have, Tony. Does well, that to? well, you know, it's, it is amazing when, how many years have you written about these things and established these facts and you've testified to them in court? Yep. Uh, you know, Peace of Blue Sky was my first book about Scientology and I, I, I read it before Russell's book and I just, I couldn't believe how good it was. And to this day, I still, you know, it's, it's, it's the best history of the church. I, I love Russell's biography of Hubbard, but as far as the development of the church, your book is untouchable. And uh, it's just amazing how for decades this stuff has been just established without a doubt in court cases, mm -hmm. in publications, and yet Scientology says boo. And even today, these media organizations just crap their pants, mm -hmm. uh, spe especially this year. For some reason, it's coming back a little bit, John. I think after Going Clear and Leah's show, there was a period where the, the media got a little braver, mm -hmm. thanks to Alex Gibney, thanks especially to Mike and Leah and the incredible work they did. I think it bolstered media companies for a while, but now it feels like once again, I'm running into just editors that are so frightened and it, there's no excuse for it. All this stuff, I mean, gosh, it's, it is it is incredible. The documents we have, the the patterns we're, we are able to show, you know, uh, but anyway, I'm, that's a digression. But um, yeah, so I but I hadn't heard those words, Operation Rawhide. That was great. I'm glad you brought that into my story. I looked, I looked online. I can't find any other mention of it. I think I think you used those words for the first time in at the bunker. So thank you. There we go. <laughs> Another first. But yeah, I like that I, idea. I like that idea where they were panicked about this guy. We better check out what we know. They found evidence that he was involved in Scientology, and then they've spent the last. 52 years denying it yeah and and that thought that they collected the information we would never have found this stuff out otherwise <laughs> you know it's um and and that's so typical of scientology it is, the, it is. The, the massive own goal complex of scientology i mean to to touch on what you said i, I think the time suit i, I think you know that the time stood up and that 20 years went by and in 2011, you know, they're vindicated. And that's the point where Janet Reitman writes her Rolling Stone article and gets a contract to write Inside Scientology, um, which is largely based upon my work and Russell's work, according to its own reference notes, which I am slightly annoyed about. But somebody had to make money out of it. It just wasn't me. Um, but that was the point. Then you got South Park. Janet Reitman's Inside Scientology, and I and I think the the South Park episode. I've long felt that that that, that had a tremendous significance because I found that you know there were quite a number of people I met over the years had actually been recruited because they'd heard it was Alexander Mitchell at the Sunday Times who put it out that Hubbard had been involved with Crowleyite magic, and they joined because they wanted to do that. So it was sort of you've got to have this balance if you want to put somebody off the idea of Scientology it is sinister and potentially very dangerous indeed but it's also ridiculous and if you put those two things packaged together you get South Park you know, <laughs> and then Anonymous made all of the noise they made I, I really think that was a very badly planned campaign I've often said they should have picketed the offices of rich Scientologists rather than Scientology orgs, because if business was failing, you know, in that way, then then that would have had more of an impact. And, and where that's happened, I think it has had some significance. But it, yeah, it became okay. So from um, 1990, when the original expurgated version of Blue Sky was released, through till 2011, I don't believe there was another book in the English language. 20 years and then they started pouring out you know especially you know with um being able to to publish through you know various platforms online and some incredible memoirs came along and this is something i was thinking about earlier today that 
there really have been some remarkable first person testimonies, you know, starting with uh, Dr. Joe Winter, a doctor's report on Dianetics in 1951, where the guy who had published, Art Sepos, who'd published Dianetics, stopped the publication because he figured that Hubbard was a fraud and then commissioned Winter who'd been with Hubbard for three months solid working on Dianetics and all this. And Winter thought that Dianetics was a good idea. I tend to disagree, but nonetheless, but he was saying this Hubbard guy, he's just, he's whack, you know, he is terrible. Then you get say, uh, Helen O'Brien's Dianetics in Limbo, which I don't think was ever actually published. Mm. Um, it's in the Library of Congress. And she sent me a copy of the full manuscript. And she ran the Philadelphia doctorate course and all of Scientology in 52, 53. Yeah. And there's this horror story. And then we get more and more, you know, Cyril Vosper's books some good journalist books, George Malko, Paulette Cooper, um, C.H. Rolfe, uh, all sorts of accounts. And there's, I think there's a bit of a problem because there is so much material. And so for me, you know, Blue Sky has remained relevant because it's the content text in which these things happened and often what i find is that people don't progress beyond telling their story that they're, they're not curious enough to understand how does it work you know what was hubbard drawing on i went and read the books that he recommended and you're going look you're scientologist you should read hypnotism comes of age because he says you should read it and there you find the techniques he's going to use i, I wrote a paper called never believe a hypnotist uh, which was it was a, a real you know moment of revelation for me i just took every reference i could find hypnosis suggestion reverie trance in the indices of scientology's own books up from 50 to 52 and in that period hubbard was so candid about how you do this to people and then you go but he's describing what would later become the scientology bridge how you get you know you enslave people psychologically uh, and of course, physically, ultimately, you know, Scientology and the organization, it's a form of modern slavery. Um, you know, when, when I first interviewed Mike Rinder and he said, yeah, I was 18 years old. I'd, I'd gone to the ship in, in, I think Lisbon, it was in 1973. And, and I was going to train to be an executive in Australia and they take his passport away and then say, you've been swapped. The organization has bought us, we've given them some courses and they've given you to us mm. and so it has continued i mean mark and claire headley's attempt to prove human trafficking and the fear that you talked about that that's there in the media it's everywhere it's in governments and you know i, I had a situation when tony blair was prime minister he read a copy of blue sky mm. and somebody who Somebody who was there saw him actually try and give it to Jack Straw, who was the foreign minister, and he refused to take the book. <laughs> it's, like, it's laden with dark forces. And that kind of, well, will it get us any votes? Will it get, you know, the idea that so many presidents in the US have allowed this criticism of Germany um, for being anti-religious, you know, secretaries of state have repeatedly said this. And we go back to uh, Clinton. Who, who said, you know, when I was at Oxford, I had a chum who was a Scientologist, so it can't be that bad. And you're going, well, but do you know anything about it? Right. You know? And that was Richard Reese, who I, I did, did know, um, who was not a very good advertisement for the benefits of Scientology, poor man. He was very depressed and upset and in charge of all of Scientology's auditing in the UK. It was a situation when I was at the end of my time in Scientology, in the morning he had Van Morrison in his in session in the afternoon he had me and we were the only two people richard was so high up we were the only two people he didn't work obviously uh, both van morrison and i left scientology but uh, but at that you know the, just the whole idea of its size that that i think amazon and richard dawkins have both talked about scientology being a major religion now you and i know it's got about twenty five thousand maybe signed up members but it's like a frog that's puffed itself up to this huge size and, and has frightened people. And that intimidation, which is fundamental to Scientology, has scared people off. And that's 
that must now be making your job a bit well, more difficult. Well, well part part well part of what motivates me is uh, what you're getting at, and that is there's this intimidation factor because people are mystified by it, and demystifying it is something that I've always sought to do. For example, uh, you know what Scientology actually is. You mentioned some things, but to me, it's always you know you said ridiculous, but to me also it's so repetitive and boring yes. and 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 I, I want people to understand that and also you know uh at my website at the not my sub stack but at the dot the original website i have these quotes from hubbard every day i want people to see the actual things he said because mm-hmm. they're so ridiculous mm-hmm. and when people start to really learn about the trs and the grades and the ot's and and the repetition um, and the sort of like, just sort of fantasy. I mean, when Hubbard's talking about PCs, you know, making matter, uh, you know, appear and disappear, and you're thinking, does it? Does anybody really believe that? So I, I like to lift that veil a little bit to show people that the actual stuff of Scientology is so repetitive and kind of silly, and I hope that that drains away some of the fear that. It's actually better to laugh at Scientology in front of it. Yeah, I, I I think it's very important to put it in perspective. And and as as you know, the the historian of Scientology, um, it I became fascinated. I I have this idea that for an academic, this is an impossible subject. Steve Kent and Sue Rain have done really important work. Um, I I. Steve and I met, you know, a long distance when he was working on his first paper back, wow. at, you know, on the Rehabilitation Project Force in about 92 or 93. Wow. And I helped put together the collection that, that the university has there, University of Alberta, um, which is enormous. Um, but this other collector and I worked together and we put together a hundred bankers boxes of material. Uh, but in digging into this stuff as you say it's incredibly repetitive he really doesn't have many ideas and you know i wrote a paper called Prob- probable origins for dianetics and scientology because that interested me too that you know uh, and and that came off a paper that jeff jacobson had written jeff did great work and but what he'd done was said this idea exists here and hubbard uses it what i did was to say and this is where hubbard mentions this source so for ex- you know one of the simplest things the idea of the the trauma of birth the birth engram on the back cover of dianetics the modern Sen- science of mental health there is an advertisement for a book by dr nandor uh, Fod- fodor called the search for the beloved the trauma of birth and prenatal conditioning so this was published a year before by the same publisher ah. so you're finding that these wonderful and Alistair Crowley also talked about this. You're finding that these ideas come from somewhere else Mm -hmm. and that he's just caught hold of a few of them and they're simplistic. His view of the universe is pathetic. Um, And he then makes all sorts of outrageous claims. You know, we can cure cancer, leukemia, we can raise people from the dead and you kind of go, it's not really happening any of this. Uh, talking with Karen de la Carrière last year, she she said, you know, nobody's more experienced in Scientology than Karen. 46 years, one of only eight people trained to the highest level, the class 12 case supervisor, all of these years. And, and she was saying that whenever you say to somebody, I, I don't believe in it anymore, they go, but didn't you have any wins? And it's sort of, but look at all of these claims, you know, you'll be a perfect human being, you'll never catch a cold again, you'll, um, you know, you'll be emotionally completely stable, and everything will be wonderful if you do this stuff. 1950 version, 1951 version, 1950, the same promises being made repeatedly. When I interviewed John McMaster, who was the world's first real clear, I mean, Hubbard for 15 years has been selling this, John said, um, I don't really know why he made me the first clear. I'd been doing it for some months and he came to me one day and he said, right, you're done. And 
it was weird. A few years later, but maybe 10 years later in the 90s, I had a call from a guy who was a Hollywood set designer. And he said, um, he'd always wondered, he said, I was one of the first 10 clears. And he said, and the thing that surprised us was that seven of us were gay. We mm. called ourselves the queer clears. Mm. Why do you think that is, John? And it's like, you haven't worked that out yet, that, that you were blackmailable. You know? And so Hubbard had, and John McMaster, you know, ah, dear, what a character. He was so beloved. There were so many people who saw him talk and who just were rapturous about him. Well, see, and that's an interesting, that's an interesting notion that Hubbard knew how to take advantage of that. Hubbard mm -hmm. recognized in McMaster that he was charismatic. He was a great speaker. I mean, I've I, you, I've read the same things you have about what an impression he made on people and what a great ambassador he was for Scientology. That's why Hubbard put him out there. Now, for the you know, because Hubbard, I think, uh, he was a little different than Miscavige in that way because Miscavige has something similar today in Grant Cardone. You know, every time Grant Cardone is put out there. We've seen evidence of it at in LA. I've seen evidence of it in Florida. He draws a massive crowd, which you don't is very hard now in Scientology. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of very, very enthusiastic people. And I have wondered why. And also, he's not afraid to say, Yeah, I'm a Scientologist, which is so becoming so rare for people mm -hmm. in public view. And I have wondered why Miscavige doesn't use him more. And I just have to conclude. It's just inferiority that he just he hates the idea of somebody else getting the limelight, whereas apparently Hubbard, to a certain amount, allowed that with McMaster until he turned on him. Right. Yeah. And but but McMaster told me that 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 Hubbard was incredibly jealous. Ah, OK. So he would come off the stage and have all this applause and Hubbard would be sulking and upset about it. Interesting. Um, Let's put a little story on, on the record. Uh, uh, Janice Gillum Grady, in, in her excellent, uh, the, the first volume of Commodore's Messenger, which is a really touching book, um, she talks about why John McMaster left and she doesn't have the right information. John told me why he left. He left because he was overboarded, he was thrown into the water, and he broke his collarbone on the way down, and he spent two hours in the water screaming, trying to have them get him out. So that's L. Ron Hubbard, the, you know, the man who was going to relieve all of our trauma. That was the way that he behaved. Right. But with John, it, it was just this, it's this weird charade that, that he traveled all around the world with the secretary called Colin. And I, because we'd all left and I really wasn't in, interested in doing any more Scientology, but I knew about the Gay Theta Association in Los Angeles. So I wrote to John and I said, you know, it's okay to be gay, it's fine. And I got a seven page handwritten letter saying, I am not a homosexual, you know. And it was weird because when I was in Sunland, um, I stayed in the house he'd been in three months before and the woman said, I had to throw him out because I have two teenage daughters and I came home at three o'clock in the afternoon and he was chasing his boyfriend naked around the house, you know, but he was not a homosexual. Uh, so you've got this deception that, you know, is, is so much a part of Scientology and so much a part of any authoritarian cult where you have some person who in public, they look one way, you know, they seem to be wonderful. So you look at say Rajneesh, you know, doing these, me nasty, me nasty sort of stuff. And then you find out who he was behind the screen, that, that right. he was this absolutely, you know, horrific human being who, and this is, this is the point with Hubbard, which is certainly not true of Jolly West. Hubbard didn't care about anybody but himself. Uh, you know, when he hears that Quentin has, has, has killed himself, his son has killed himself. He's like, oh, more bad public relations. That's his response. You know, he was inhumanly self-obsessed. Um, and I, you know, certainly in dealing with Jolly West, he was somebody who was deeply concerned. Somebody told me a, a year or so back, I did a thing where I mentioned Jolly West and somebody said, oh, but he was involved with, with Waco. And I said, well, that's interesting you say that because I was with him 
in Los Angeles while Waker was going on. And you're quite right. He was ringing the FBI and the ATF up and saying, what on earth are you doing? So, you know, very easy to twist stories and, and, and get the wrong idea about something. Well, I certainly heard a lot about him when I was starting out uh, in the 90s. And, uh, but I, I appreciate that you really have filled out the picture for us a little bit more uh, with that piece this week. Like I said, we've got just wonderful reaction from my readers. They absolutely loved it. And, uh, you know, we, we appreciate it anytime you're in the bunker, John. Well, thank you. And, and you know, we, we need to, you know, we need to make sure that every six months or something we talk and, and, and then see what's going on. Because, you know, the bunker is a, is a, a really special place, a really unique place. And when I you know, we first were in touch, which is 10 years ago now, that thought that there was a place where I could put material that might be helpful to people who'd been in, involved with Scientology, so the 60 or 70 articles that you put up, it, it that was a new thing, having somewhere that people could come and, and, you know, of course, my, you know, my view of Scientology, having dealt with I don't know, about 600 people in there, their recovery, their progression away from it, and seeing how stuck people get. And I came back then after, you know, I'd had 16 years of harassment and a, a little bit of peace and quiet in between, what, 17 years. And coming back and being able to say, actually, people don't naturally recover from mm. Scientology. You remember there was a piece where I, I said something about Conway and Siegelman, and you went off and contacted them and proved me wrong. And, and I was in touch with them after that, which was great, because I said, you know, you said that Scientology is, you know, the hardest thing to recover from of all of the groups you've looked at that were with, you know, the Krishnas or the Moonies, three to six months later, you're back in society. And they got this strange estimate, which is 12 and a half years for Scientology. And I went to them and said, um, that was a guess, wasn't it? Because the reality is that many people will never recover. They replace the language. And that started me thinking about Scientology in Hubbard's own terms, that what he kept talking about was implanting. And so in his terms, Scientology is worth implanting the ideas of Aaron Hubbard into somebody, and they will tend to keep on believing. You can't use evidence. You know, I've done all the stuff on evidence. You've got to get into how did he put this into somebody's head and how can they now start thinking about it, which is not an elaborate process. You know, if as soon as somebody is willing to challenge one of his ideas and say, that's a silly idea. You know, when I, I was surprised when I talked with Aaron Smith Levin, um, that, you know, towards the end of our conversation, I asked him about his recovery and he said, what recovery? And, and, and he said, you know, some of the ideas in Scientology are good ideas. And I'm sort of, I don't think so. Having had you know, 50 years of involvement with this thing. I really don't think so. Anything that seems good is better stated in the source he stole it from because he couldn't keep anything straight. And I went through the, you know, affinity reality communication. If you increase communication, you will always increase affinity. And I said, so you shoot somebody, you shout at somebody. That's not going to increase their affinity, is it? So this scientific formulation is nonsense. And the resistance to that, that people have, you know, the cognitive dissonance that it evokes, it, Scientology is an incredible trap where with well, most- Well, yeah, like in a trap sense, I was just going to say, like with the winds thing, uh, for example, you set up this mentality where anything good that happens in your life, you automatically credit it to Scientology. Mm -hmm. Anything bad that happens in your life, you blame yourself for not doing Scientology standardly. You did not apply the technology correctly. And it's the same in every authoritarian cult. All good flows from the leader and the doctrine and whatever is wrong, and there's always quite a lot wrong, is because you didn't do it properly. Um, so you're always the fall guy in, in that situation. The other thing is, and somebody, you know, early on, I, I wrote a piece uh, for the bunker about training routine zero, and, and somebody in the comments said um, that they'd felt that in doing training routines, they were being trained to be a sociopath. 
And that was such an insightful comment, kind of going, well, actually, Scientology is a way of developing narcissistic sociopathy. So people become totally self-involved. They become little Hubbards where it's all about getting the next level. It's all about doing the next course. And if, like Lainey Aramer, they need to rob a bank so that they can do it, then that's what they'll do, you know? And they become auditing junkies. The whole And th that whole process of Scientology, which is you have very good indicators at the end of your session, which is the euphoria that just about, you know, you can stimulate that in people with such ease. Um, but people don't know that. They're not taught about the Gansfeld effect and how you can... Uh, you know, create a euphoric state in somebody in, in 10 minutes. I remember when I was still in, involved, I uh, had this guy who'd been, uh, he was a hippie, he'd been taking acid and he, and he thought this was really great. And I said, I, I can actually get you to experience this without drugs. All you have to do is train your team zero. And sure enough, within 10 minutes, of course he was hallucinating because that's the Gansfeld effect. And um, he was quite keen on it and may not have been the right thing because he actually went and joined the Ministry of Defence, you know, after that. So <laughs> tilted him in the wrong direction. <laughs> wow. Well, listen, this is, again, I really appreciate you thinking of the bunker for this piece. I'm glad mm -hmm. we could put it out. Uh, you, you had said to me when we were going back and forth, you apologize for the length, but this is what I love about the underground bunkers audience. They care about this subject. They care about this level of detail. And that's what I saw again and again in the comments is how much they 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 really appreciated that you dug deep here. So from for the underground bunker audience, I'm saying thank you, John. Thank you for thinking of us. And I uh, can't wait for your next one, man. Great. And and let me just, you know, do a puff. We've we've just released the audio book of Scientology, the Cult of Greed. Now, this, this was a, a talk that I gave um, some years ago. But what I wanted to do, I'd, years ago, I wrote a thing called The Total Freedom Trap. And I came back to it to revise it and went, this really doesn't have the material I want. What I want to be able to do is highlight the worst of Scientology. And um, when people have, and, and a few people have, criticized the, the history that I've put forward of Scientology, and the thing I have to say to them is, the, the main source of this history is Ron Hubbard. Yeah. You know, I, I talked with, I, there were about 150 people involved one way or another, interviews I did, books I read, testimony. But most of the material comes from Hubbard. And the same is true with Cult of Greed, that you have, you know, for example, his um, 1947, the letter where he, he asked for psychiatric treatment, <laughs> having just developed a process that cured everything. You know, the, he's begging because his mind is deranged to get his treatment. Um, the 1949, January 49 letter that, that, that you found uh, to Fori Ackerman, his, his agent, where he's saying he can rape women without them knowing about it. He's not talking about helping anybody. No. He's saying more no. money-making angles. Than, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, I would urge everybody to rush out and, and grab a copy of um, Scientology Cult of Greed as an audio book, as an e-book, as, as a it's cheap. Um, it's me reading it. Imagine that. Well, and, make uh, sure you give me a link so I can include it in the post when we put up this great. video. Will, okay. Then. All yep. right, John. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. And thanks for staying up late. I know it's late over there. It's fine. Always good to talk to you. All righty. Bye-bye.